Welcome to the Not Sorry Art Podcast. I'm Sari Shrike, the artist and creator behind Not Sorry Art. I'm so excited to talk art and creativity with you. So grab a drink, grab a snack, and let's dive in. I also wanted to say that today's episode is sponsored by my book. I have a book coming out. I'm so proud of this, guys. Um, The links are already up. I'll have them in the show notes. But the book is called Modern Still Life, From Fruit Bowls to Disco Balls. It is my take on a step-by-step painting book. I am really excited about it. Not only does it have like motivational tips and tricks to keep you going in your practice, but it also has clear and beautiful and full color breakdowns of the step-by-step process in my paintings. So I could not be more excited about it. If you wanted to check it out, pre-order it, it would help me more than you even know. Hello, welcome back to the Not Sorry Art Podcast. I'm Sari, thanks for being here. Today's episode is about context. (laughs) Context is a word that has, I have, it's been showing up over and over in my own work in how I talk about social media for a little more context. (laughs) Um, I have been working with a couple of mentees this year. I had um, put off a little bit of time in the beginning of uh, 2024 to work with mentees one-on-one for kind of a big chunk of the year. And I've enjoyed it. A little bit of it is business, you know, catching up, best practices, all of that. A little bit of it is like technical troubleshooting of painting and a little bit of it has been the part that has delighted me to no end how much I enjoy it I had a hunch I was going to enjoy it but I have found myself just like learning and just enjoying it that's I'll just leave it at that Um, but it's the part about sort of the emotional connection like why are we making this kind of art where is the fear and how we're you know showing up and There has been so much richness in those conversations, but the thing that keeps coming up over and over is this idea about context, creating context for yourself. And this can be everything from social media, how we show up in social media, all the way to sort of who gives us the right to be taken seriously and to really explore our art in a way. Like there's this real pull, I think for a lot of people, I think for women, I think for anyone who feels like an outsider in some capacity, to want to sort of downplay what you're doing because you don't have maybe the, the capital, the like social cultural capital to be seen as someone who is meant to be taken seriously. I will get into all this. I'm going to elaborate. We're going to talk a little bit about Pierre Bourdieu and all of this. So his book called Distinction, um, I read <laughs> piecemealed together recently and have listened to a lot of like panels of these great philosophers talking about it and translating it into sort of 21st century context and specifically context in the United States. And I've just been geeking out. And basically this episode is going to be a confluence of those ideas the reason I'm talking about it is because understanding habitats and what what capital sort of is has been exactly the clarity that I have needed to understand how to create context for myself as an artist. So I'm going to talk about that. Don't worry, we're not going to just all talk about philosophy. We're also going to wade into sort of real life practical application and how I think this concept can be really empowering for artists, for any kind of artist, but specifically if you feel on the outside and no matter what you do you kind of feel like you're an imposter I try not to use imposter syndrome too much because it is a bit of a buzzword but I think it fits great in this episode then this episode is for you so with that thanks for being here and let's just dive in so first I want to set the stage a little bit of like how this conversation came up most recently because I actually met with one of my mentees last night or yesterday evening and we had a great conversation and at some point they brought up feeling as though they have to earn the right to have bigger, deeper conversations about their art. I'm not going to give too many details out of respect for their journey and what they're doing, but they're they're dabbling in an arena that... You know, we don't give, I think I could speak generally enough. There's themes of motherhood, which motherhood is incredibly important. It's incredibly important. I mean, what are some of the biggest, you know, political, domestic political issues right now that the United States is facing? A lot of it has to do with motherhood and right to choose and right to plan. So I do think it's incredibly power. And yet on the flip side, I feel like, and I'm hoping it's changing, But I feel like when you tiptoe into talking about motherhood on a stage like fine art, oil painting, etc., 
um, you kind of have to differentiate yourself from like regular moms or the rest of moms. You know, to be a mother is in a lot of ways when you're stepping into a very male dominant space, such as the philosophy of art and painting, you know, it's not craft. A lot of times you, I understand this feeling of not being taken seriously. And as a mother myself, <laughs> I certainly have felt that. But this is something that I've, I've thought a lot about in my own career. And so I felt very excited that I was able to share with them some insight because I think I've manually had to work through this myself. Okay, so for a little bit of context, and this is what I told my mentee too. I told them a story about a, a generational wound in my family of origin. So dyslexia and various learning disabilities runs in my family um, pretty strong, particularly on my dad's side. And there is a theme of people who are very intelligent, but do awful at school, you know, struggle to learn to read. I didn't learn how to read with any proficiency until fifth grade. I can remember the moment it finally all clicked and I was able to switch from guess reading to actually reading. <laughs> My dad was held back two years um, in elementary school and ended up dropping out of sophomore year. And, you know, my grandfather has issues with this like he ended up being an engineer but he never got a degree and so every time he'd get a promotion they would have to you know he worked his way up through the army but every time he would get a promotion they'd have to change the contract to you know a master's of engineering or the work experience equivalent and then write in however many years he had been an engineer and this is a theme <laughs> throughout my family my dad really struggled because you know he struggled with addiction you know he was disabled physically early in his life uh, in his 20s and um and yet he was also a very creative very sensitive and very intelligent person um at the same time so my dad despite dropping out sophomore year of um high school loved physics always loved physics he used to tell me a story <laughs> about him being a little kid swinging on the swing set and just like loving that sensation of weightlessness in the air and like having this like deep desire to understand like why there was that moment of weightlessness and so he became really interested in physics and throughout the years he'd go in phases of like really digging into physics um, on his own just finding books at thrift stores at the library and learning about physics you know cut to my childhood when I was in probably elementary school maybe middle school and he tinkered around with physics enough that he, and I'm recalling this from memory. So if you're listening to this and you're a physics person and I'm recalling something correctly, just with a grain of salt. My dad used to love tinkering with planks constant. <laughs> and at one point he figured out like a minor thing. Like he basically figured out how to get the formula for planks constant to match up more closely with the experimental you know, what does that mean? I, I never took a physics class. All my physics knowledge is from my dad just like talking with me about physics. So, but it was, you know, for him pretty exciting. He wrote, he put together to the best of his ability via Google, <laughs> a paper. I remember him part-time going to the library, you know, when we had moments where we had a working computer, he would um, work on that. And he was able, you know, the town I grew up in had multiple good colleges. And he was able to procure a meeting and kind of a relationship with the Missouri State physics professor. And, you know, eventually he was able to sit down with this professor and show him his work. And, you know, and the professor was like, you know, this is great. It wasn't some big life. Again, it was a minor, um, you know, tweak. But he was like, yeah, this checks out. However, like you don't have a degree. <laughs> you are, you know, you, you would never be able to propose this to work on this. Like that's just not how this system works. Like you would have to go to school. And, you know, I think the professor encouraged my dad, you know, to go to community college, get your associates, then go to school for, you know, he was trying. It just wasn't, I, I don't know why. I'm not going to speak to that, I guess, because I don't really know. Like I think my dad could have probably gotten a Pell Grant and he probably could have maybe been able to do that. But for any reason, Regardless, my dad took this as a huge hit and I remember he struggled with it. Again, I'm a little kid watching my dad struggle with addiction and seeing how sad he was about this. And I think, you know, what, what did that leave? What did that impress upon me? The importance of these certificates, you know, that they're, that it matters that like, even if you do something, <laughs> we don't live in a world where the work stands on its own. And I feel like that's, you know, the American spirit, whether this is more, you know, mythology or actual sort of national creed. Our American mythology says that like, if you just, if you do it, if you show up, if you do the real work like that, you know, we're, we're we broke from Europe 
to contrast with the stuffy aristocracy. Uh, and yet that's not the way the world works. You know, you have to have these degrees. You have to, you know, you have to go through the, the hoops. And I will say I, this isn't just me fully entirely criticizing all all degrees and all I, I'm all for education I want my doctors to take boards I want them to regularly keep up with science I want there to be a threshold especially in things like structural engineering and medicine and things that are deeply consequential I want there to be you know structures in place to make sure that people are up to date and are abiding by you know scientifically agreed upon rules and regulations I'm all for that however I think a lot about, you know, the word inconsequential in regards to art. <laughs> and art is both art like physics in some way. You know, physics is sort of theory. You know, there's obviously there's real life application to it. Of course, of course, of course, physics ties into everything. Even as a visual artist, I know that when I'm looking at, at light, I'm, I'm doing real life application of physics analysis. It's great. It ties into everything. I'm not saying that. But, you know, what my dad was doing, <laughs> if they had let him in, it wouldn't have... Like he, he didn't risk someone's health. He wasn't like a crackpot snake oil salesman who was trying to say that he's, you know, he's a chiropractor who can sell someone colloidal silver, you know, again, not saying I'm against <laughs> degrees uh, or requirements and standards, rather that we're a culture that for good or for bad, you know, whatever nuance we want to find in there, it, our pedigree matters, you know, who we are matters but i i want i want to say this and i want to say that it's not a death sentence the last thing i'll say about this particular part of the story of like my personal anecdote is that i took you know there's this i love this saying that the characteristics the strongest characteristics we develop within ourselves are often the characteristics that would have saved our parents and i know that may not be true for everyone but it's absolutely true for me <laughs> and a lot of people I know. And that's exactly what I did. For me, I part of why I was so dead set on college was because I knew that to break out of sort of my generational trauma, <laughs> that I was going to have to push through the dyslexia and I was going to have to push through and get the degree. And I was going to have to find ways to be tenacious and make it work. And yes, I'm 100% here because of all kinds of privileges and certainly all kinds of dumb random luck but there was a ferocity and an intentionality behind me pursuing a degree being the first person in my family to graduate with a degree and even as I tiptoed into the art world in my early 20s my degree was something I clung to and I don't mean this in a way of like I think that people who don't have degree like for me it was just I could have told someone else you don't have to have a degree you don't have to be you know you can be self-taught to be an artist but it was a wound of mine to be able to be like, I have a degree. But the last or at least the next layer of healing behind that was sort of learning how to take apart, to sort of reverse engineer. Well, why do I need that degree? And what does it say about me? And what does it say about our culture? Which brings me to a big theme that I worked on in my visual art, which is, you know, class, class identifiers and how certain aspects of class create context for our humanity and this is also lessons I learned during childhood you know I the thing about being you know poor in America is you know that with the right change of clothes and with straighter teeth and with a little bit of visual context you can go from being someone who is shooed out of fast food restaurants because people think you're not gonna buy food <laughs> to people call you ma'am and ask you if you would like to order something. And so, you know, and it's it, like something that seems very superficial, I understood at an early age could unlock your humanity. So formally, informally, this is something that I play with throughout my career, right? And this brings me to a place where, you know, throughout the, my late 20s and definitely into my 30s, I found myself reading a lot of books on, on class and which led me to philosophy on capital, on cultural capital. And of course, that brings me to finally breaking down and reading Pierre Bourdieu. I have played with his themes for many years as someone who is interested in class and habitats. So this is the part of the podcast I'm going to talk to you about habitats and briefly go through different kinds of cultural capital. Because what I think I like about this kind of work is taking stuff that it feels like vibes, like someone just doesn't fit the vibe, you don't fit the vibe, you don't fit in. And there's 
this real tendency to be like, you know, just be yourself. And and I agree with all of that. But I I like taking what I feel like is good wisdom that can fall into platitudes and teasing out the truth and the context and where and why that doesn't always apply, which for me reveals a lot of the flaws in our culture. So all that to say, <laughs> definitely check out the abridged version of Distinction. It's a fantastic book. But Pierre Bourdieu is a French philosopher who, I think he wrote this book in the 90s, 1990s. I know he, his like working time was like the 60s through the late 20th century. And, you know, I will say a little bit of a disclaimer, caveat, <laughs> if you will. You know, France is a, uh, you know, in late mid to late 20th century France, um, is almost entirely a white country and so a massive glaring blind spot for Pierre Bourdieu's work is he does he basically does not take into account race which I think even in a country France during the mid to late 20th century that is predominantly one ra- race I still think it is a blind spot and I think it is not fair to completely just take Pierre Bourdieu's work and transpose it onto the U.S. in our class system if you are looking for a really good book recommendation that does take that to account Isabel Wilkerson's book Cast is absolutely fantastic it is probably my number one best recommended like must read book I yeah it's fantastic anyways all that to say there are flaws to this <laughs> this is not me it's just insightful I think what like I said I like when you can take an idea that feels I don't know like gaseous like it's just like there's nothing it can stick to it's just it's a feeling it's a vibe it's a be yourself doesn't always apply and why doesn't it always apply and I don't know it just doesn't for some people or some things or some ideas anyways and then take someone's philosophy and apply it to it and then begin to deduce some ideas out of it so okay I'm going to read a brief uh, summary of it so his book distinction is you know a sociological analysis uh, exploring how the social status and power are maintained and reproduced through taste and preferences and culture so the clothes you wear your recreational activities um, you know where you vacation where do your children go to school all the, your your accent things like that Bordeaux investigates the way in which aesthetic choices ranging from art, food, music, and clothing are not merely individual or subjective but deeply embedded in social class distinctions. So the core argument of distinction is that tastes are formed by social context, by, you know, your your taste and like I said, just all the things you do, food, who you hang out with, etc. And that habitus, which is like the sort of outside, like the cultural agreed upon social norms in regards to aesthetics and taste dictate our, our taste and perspective. And the thing is, if you were here for last year's Summer Book Club series that I did with Megan E. Collins, um, I still love those episodes. Definitely go check, back and check them out. But we did a book um, about all about taste. There was a, you know, Chromophobia talks about this a little bit, which is another book. But we, the book that we read, I believe it was the first, I'm blanking on the title. But <laughs> anyways, the initial sort of argument that the author gives in the book about taste is that scientists have really teased out and are pretty confident that we don't have a lot of innate taste that so much of what we like and we don't like all the way down to like the taste itself you know sugar salt whatever is through how we experience our own our own culture it's like we are conditioned to like what we don't like there's a little bit of an inclination towards sweet and as we become a little bit older in our first year of life we start to develop a little bit of an inclination towards salt aside from that everything that we like we learn through our interaction with cultural habitus. There's like familial habitus. You know, my mom likes black licorice and maybe I wouldn't have liked black licorice, but my mom gave me little bits of black licorice my whole childhood. And now I really like black licorice. Someone, you go out in the world and you really identify with the fact that you like black licorice. It, it gives you, what does this say to people? You know, it's not that deep. It's just that you like black licorice. No, no, I would argue it definitely is that deep. Liking black licorice means that you push through the slightly off-putting, <laughs> chemically herbaceous taste. You know, it says that maybe your mom is from the part of Europe who likes licorice. It says that you're a little unique. You know, when you're a young kid and the main most important <laughs> social characteristic is fitting in, maybe it kind of, maybe it doesn't help your social standing. But then as you push through, you learn to like it about yourself. You know what I mean? Like it, it does, even something as innocuous as liking or not liking licorice, 
tells us a little bit about someone because everything, all the aesthetic choices we make plug in to cultural habitus. Okay, I could talk about this forever. I'm going to try to rein it back in and, and get to the, you know, the sort of practical <laughs> section of this. So let me know if you guys want a full episode on this book because I could talk about it forever. But getting back to, to, to capital, there's basically four kinds of capital that Pierre Bourdieu lays out. There's economic capital, which is the most obvious kind. How much money do you have in your bank account? How much money does your family have, etc. It's just how much money do you have? Cultural capital, there's multiple different kinds of cultural capital. It's going to be like knowledge, skills, education, both social education and formal education. It's your manners. I remember there was a TikTok going around and it was from a dark documentary, but it was um, a boy who grew up in these fancy boarding schools, Very come, came from a very wealthy family. And it was a conversation about peeling oranges. And his instructor was telling him that there is a right way to peel oranges. And, you know, that you start with a knife and you start at the top and then it's circular. I might be miss, missing the, <laughs> the details of this. So if you went to elite boarding schools and you had this orange conversation and I'm off, apologies. But the point was that there was one very right way to peel an orange and the right way was simply in, imposed so that people who did not have or not privy to this knowledge could feel as though they were lesser or inferior. And that was it. That was the, I, you know, the whole reason that there was a right way to peel an orange. You could sort of, you know, push comes to shove, make an argument that this is cleaner or more effective. But that doesn't really matter. <laughs> no one's going to probably do a scientific test to figure that out. The point is that there are these distinctions and rules and, um, you know, theories we have about people and how, what they like and how they do things that funnel into these different kinds of capital. You also have social capital. This is represented by your networks, connections, family, and the resources that they have access to. So it's going to be your network, who you know, <laughs> you know, even being someone who lives in a big city or if you've went to a prestigious college, you know, the connections that you make there are an an important aspect of your capital. And then we have symbolic capital, and this is the one that becomes pertinent to my particular story, and I think for a lot of other artists. Symbolic capital is a form of recognition, prestige, or honor that society bestows upon the individual. So this is everything from like your diploma from college, it can be. And I will say different forms of capital can have one foot in one and one foot in the other. They can also, the degree can indicate that you have social capital, etc. other kinds of things. So the, the lines are blurry, and again, this isn't a perfect science, um, but this is the art degree. This is going to be the physics degree. This, amongst other things, of course, was the thing holding my dad back. He not him not having this, and likely, if you can read between the lines, it the lack of the symbolic capital of a degree indicating that he did not have and possess the other forms of capital was the thing keeping this, you know, maybe minor but very real little you know scientific breakthrough that my dad had from being sort of recognized at least by him at that time so where does this all apply to, to artists and I think the thing is you have to begin to create your own capital and I, I say all this because like I said in the beginning it's important sometimes to know what you're up against imposter syndrome to me is when we and our feeling of worth runs into these sort of unspoken rules and delineations between different kinds of cu cultural, economic, and social, and of course, symbolic capital. Um, and this is just one way of dissecting this. You could also say that, you know, imposters, I guess what I'm saying is I always get frustrated when the conversation around imposter syndrome comes to like an, an individual responsibility of like, well, just be more confident in yourself. And I know that like I'm sitting here in a podcast talking to you and my only real bid for change is to, is to talk to each one of you who are listening at this point and say to you, you know, there are real things at play that help to contribute to that sense of, of uh, imposter syndrome and that you should feel empowered to know that these are just aspects of habitus and not actually things that denote that you have lesser worth. And I know that that, you know, it's the irony of like, I'm not doing anything communal with this podcast. Like I'm talking to one person and hopefully 
giving someone and emboldening them to take themselves seriously and to honor their artwork and to create context for their artwork. But what I'm trying to do is say that it's not just a you problem, (laughs) you know? It's not that you are inferior or you didn't do the work to get a, a college degree in painting and that, you know, you if you have something important to say and you feel like it's important and when you get up and you you go out in the world whether that's applying online whether that's showing your work on social media whether that's showing in person whether that's going to a workshop and then all of a sudden you start to feel inferior that there are things at play i'm not saying that they're real i'm just saying that it's not just you so last part of this episode how do we do something with that how do we take this information and let it inform our artwork. And, I, and this is where I get back to context, right? I'm hoping that with this episode, you know that if you want to say something important and you feel like, now that we know the language, that there is habitus and distinction and areas in which you feel as though maybe you don't have enough capital in some way, that that doesn't necessarily make your art lesser and that it it's worth it for you to create some of that context. So, okay, what does this mean in real life application for me? I remember feeling a ton of imposter syndrome, if I can keep using this word, or that I couldn't make deeper meanings about my artwork because I was choosing to make art about class. And the way I was choosing to make art about class was by sort of doing like the medium is the message, right? By using glitter and bright colors and, you know, painting Baja blasts and things that are typically associated with the poor, you know, cheese ball painting of Walmart, all of these things. By painting them, I was sort of pushing myself out of contention for being taken seriously. And that's exactly the opposite of what I was now that I look back, trying to do, <laughs> I was, you know, trying to sort of intentionally say, like, no, the things that I sort of unintentionally did in college and that my teammates clocked me for being, you know, very Ozark and very poor are the things I'm trying to play with now as someone who has the skill set of oil painting, of fine art painting. And the context I created for myself was making a really good artist statement of having my friends and family who are writers look over it take out all the typos and spelling errors for my dyslexia because I'm intelligent. I have a hard time with spelling and stumbling over my words because of it. But I also know that I think that the trade-off is when you sort of feel this imposter syndrome, you know, I could have looked at my, the, the, the challenge of making a good artist statement and taking myself seriously. And I could have said, you're not to be taken seriously. You're making paintings of glitter Baja blasts. And there's a lot of cultural, you know, habitus there to say that by playing with those visuals, I am not to be taken seriously. But I think I'm really glad that I emboldened myself. You know, if you have no struggle, we have no problem. Like anyone can make any kind of art and it's really important. I'm a big believer in that. You don't need an art degree. You don't need to be, you know, in the art world conversation. If you're an artist making art and you're happy, then then great. But what I'm, I guess what I'm speaking to is if you're an artist making art, And you feel like you're not invited to these bigger, deeper conversations because of who you are and what you lack or what you feel like you lack. That's not true. We can create context for ourselves by shaping the way we show up. I always tell my students like and my mentees that part of my social media strategy is like dressing up for the job you want. (laughs) And what I mean by that is like making your Instagram look and feel like it is the the Instagram of an artist who's a real artist who's showing in galleries even before you have those things in place you know that might be streamlining it that might be choosing to not include some things that might be sharing your process but treat yourself like you want to be treated or treat you know like don't let the fact that I feel like I haven't earned this or that I'm not part of this conversation keep you out and that's kind of the whole thesis of this of this episode other ways of creating context for yourself i read this book if you're if you're still here in this episode and like this sounds interesting to you another really good book that i would recommend actually they talk about pierre bourdieu's habitus and distinction so if that if you go look at the (laughs) it's a distinction is a really tough read um but there's a book called status and culture by w david marks that talks about a lot of this amongst other things that is really good anyways but there was um a part where they were talking about the musician beck and it was very very early in his career and he came up with the song i think loser was one of his first songs so it was this very like avant-garde song but it also like his song and i think his first album but i remember they were talking about his first song 
could have gone either way. It was either like an uninformed, almost like naive art, kind of like goofy, irreverent, doesn't mean anything song. Like if you listen to the lyrics, you know what my parents loved Beck. And so like I remember being a kid and like tra- like thinking that any music that made it on the radio was like important and being like, how is like this makes no sense. Part of why I think I love that song. Anyways, but um, he was young. He kind of positioned himself as like out of nowhere. Of course, he did have, I think, ties into the art world. But in the 90s, you know, the internet wasn't what it is now. So you could you could be you could profit off of relative obscurity even if that wasn't the case anyways so there was this interview um with beck and it was another artist i think mtv had this thing or vh1 or something where it was like artists interviewing artists and again beck was this toss-up and so he asked um the other artist asked beck like what his favorite music was and i don't remember the examples apology but he he said one kind of music that was very like low brow or like very it didn't help his case it tipped the scale in the direction of this is some random naive fluke one-off artist and then he mentioned some other obscure kind of jazz if I remember correctly that had a ton of cultural capital it was an indie sort of like only real musicians would know it kind of artist that he mentioned and the other artist ears perked up and and it was through that moment that Beck was sort of let in, at least in that instance. I don't know how it folded out his whole career. But Beck was able to position himself through signaling of different kinds of capital that he possessed, that he was, in fact, very well versed. He did understand all kinds of music, and yet he chose to make this sort of seemingly naive music. And I bring up this because this can happen for artists too. You can look as though, you know, you might be intentionally making art about motherhood, about womanhood, about a marginalized identity, about class, about whatever, something that there isn't a historic um, precedent for, you know, it isn't oil figurative work, whatever, and make the argument that you are to be taken serious by what else you know. Now, I'm not saying you have to know this. Again, if you want to show up and not have any context and make art and you enjoy it, that's fine. But part of how you can create your own context is if you have a deep knowledge of art and that's informing what you do, you can talk about that. You can share that as part of your strategy. You know, another example of this to some degree is Kahindi Wiley, who I adore and I really like what he does. So he paints with this hyper-realistic, almost like European oil painting sort of tradition of like royals and the way they're painted and the way the people are positioned it's very regal and it demands respect because there is a cultural precedence to the way he positions his figures and also the rich and sumptuous clothing and yet he's sort of offsetting that by the fact that he's depicting black bodies which in the united states there's this history of you know very much the opposite (laughs) and you know and it's it's not fair and it's incorrect and that's what he's highlighting but I think what's really interesting about that is that artists do this all the time you know I'm I guess what I'm trying to share with you is this sort of cheat sheet of like there's almost power to feeling as though whatever you possess that feels on the outside of of cultural capital of social capital you have a chance to see it in the way that you see it of like it's valuable it's important if you're willing to create the proper context for what you're trying to say and do. Other ways that you can do this, I know I mentioned creating an artist statement. I'll give you kind of one more specific example of it. So we live in this weird time in contemporary painting where faux naive and to some degree maybe figurative work is kind of king. <laughs> you know, if you're going to paint representational, you really do have to pay, have to, is a strong word. There's a lot of precedent for, for painting very naive to, in case that doesn't land what that means is paint as though you don't have skill even though you do have skill and so we've created this weird space where and I'm speaking in generals here but painting with an earnest skill you're either a painter's painter and it's a very niche clicky group of not clicky but you know very niche sort of like they don't let people in easily a group of people who like win national portrait society they're painters painters and their whole thing is skill and then everyone else is sort of left with like you know if you're wanting to say something more conceptual you're kind of forced into either non-representational or naive art and so where does that leave you if you're not a painter's painter <laughs> if you haven't made your way into that part of the, the painting world and yet you want to paint representationally for me 
a lot of the reason I, I really adhere myself to painting representationally was initially because I thought I was embarking on a form of capital recognizable talent that would help me in the art world. And it turns out <laughs> it did the opposite. But I stay with representational painting because at this point, the context that I've created for that skill is that I come from a long line of laborers, of people who would have never had the luxury to be able to not have that skill and have a living. <laughs> and so for me, the context that I create is through my artist statements, I have to sort of say, hint at, and declare that my skill is an intentional choice. I'm not the naive person I was 10 years ago thinking that I'll be able to be a real painter if I can paint really good. <laughs> you know, what is really good? I know, I know. But I have, content instead of like abandoning it for faux naive, I looked at, well, what do I want to do? What's important to me? And then I, 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 I balance that by creating the context and asserting it in my artist statement. Another way you can do this is by curating your own artwork. So, you know, anytime you apply to a magazine or something, you only really have so many submissions, anywhere between like two and five, sometimes 10. And I think what you choose to include is another way you can sort of create that cultural context, context for yourself and even the way you show it, you know, investing in good photos and I'm saying this like again if this none of this bothers you please do not apply you're, you're fine just the way you are and I mean that but I'm saying like if you're wanting to sort of deal with that imposter syndrome <laughs> you know by investing in yourself and taking good photos because unfortunately imposter syndrome if not tended to can sort of become a self-fulfilling cycle you can end up in a place where you're like well I'm not a real artist and then you never invest in good quality photos and then the photos that aren't good quality keep you out of the running because curators care about that stuff etc so you know do yourself the honor of organizing and curating and taking really good photos of your artwork and presenting it and it doesn't have to be fancy it's, it's one page on your website with good photos doing that for yourself how you engage on social media I mean this could be anything to what you choose to show and it doesn't have to be the most high you know whatever thing it does but like I'll say one way one kind of unconventional way that this manifests for me is like how and I respond to kind of trolley comments. You know, I'm very fortunate. I don't get too many trolley comments. Um, <laughs> but if I do make something more political, uh, you know, I, I hate that even talking about class is considered political. Shouldn't be. It's just the desire to feed poor children and poor people and treat them with humanity. But anyways, um, but it's it, it does happen. And, you know, one of the ways I do this is like, I don't always get in the weeds with everyone. You know, I said what I said. If I want to leave book recommendations, I do. You know, someone arguing in good, in good faith is all good but like someone who's not you know I don't engage with you know something like that little little ways of sort of honoring yourself networking another thing is don't count yourself out one of my favorite pieces of advice is don't tell yourself no let other people tell you no you're going to hear a lot of no's if you work in any kind of creative industry it's just I always tell my students rejection has to eventually become your white noise it's how you know you're doing it like I apply for you know five to ten things a month typically well that's a little high I, in certain seasons, it can be that high, but I guess it would average out to maybe five things a month. There are some seasons where I apply to one or two things in a month. Anyways, um, and I, it is not unheard of for me to get rejected from every single one of them. So it's just, it's part of doing the art thing, <laughs> but don't count yourself out networking or otherwise. Oh, I'm an artist. I make art, but I'm self-taught and I don't know if I can go to this opening in downtown LA because I'm not a real artist. Don't count yourself out. You make art. People do this to me all the time. And I, you know, they'll they'll tell me they're an artist, but they're not like, oh, I'm not like you though. I'm not, you know, and, and then they'll show me their work and they're, they're daily painters and their work is fantastic. And the thing that they're counting themselves out for is that they don't have an art degree. Please, no. Like if you're passionate, if you have something to say, if you're enthusiastic about your artwork in some capacity, you're in. <laughs> you should be in. You're 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 worthy of taking up space and being around other artists. Like I love talking to people about this. I love self-taught art. You know, I, there's an episode coming out next week where I interview an art teacher, and there's a lot of great insights in that episode about how much a difference of opinion and a perspective that you don't always get when you're you know funneled through art school can actually make what you have to say really refreshing, refreshing and unique. All right, the last couple of points workshops, continuing education, you know, if skill is something you don't feel like you have, you know, I think there's always an argument to is as long as your message is good, you know, but 
then then honor yourself by taking those classes, double upping on those skills, going and learning from someone who you feel like they have what you don't have. Again, if it's a trusted person, education is a very sensitive thing. If you feel safe, then do that. Build up that skill. There's lots of great information online. You know, another thing is publishing. Don't be afraid to submit your work. There, I've worked with people. And the thing is like, I've curated online magazines, online databases and things like that. And I know what submissions look like. And I'll work with an artist who's like, oh, I couldn't submit. I only have two things and my website's not that great. And I'll look at it and it's like better than half the submissions that I got when I was curating. Don't count yourself out. Do the work to make it to the best of your abilities, but like don't don't be the one to tell yourself uh, you know, you you belong. Collaborations, people always vastly underestimate their own, you know, worth and they're like, "Oh, I'm not a real artist or I'm not a real writer." It's okay. Connect with people. Let them tell you no. And it could be a no because they're in a busy season of life and it could be a no because they don't feel like you're a fit and that's okay. And the last thing I'll say is seeking feedback and critique. And this brings me all the way back to the beginning of the episode with me and my mentee and us talking about their artwork and how the importance of creating context for themselves and how even though they don't have like a traditional formal art education or a degree from it, their artwork is still important. And when we were talking about their work, we were riffing and enjoying it just like I would have in art school with my professor and my um, studio mates. And that experience of being like, this is how I respond to your work. And then they respond by this is what I intended. And that sharing of like doing what art does best. How does this make you feel? How are you responding? Do as much of that as you can because you might be thinking, well, I don't know how to visually communicate this and I don't have the degree or I don't have the experience or no one else is going to see this from my perspective. You don't know until you put it out there. And I think the thing that was most healing about our conversation last night with, with me and my mentee was I got it. I got what she was saying. You know, they were making work and by, you know, me being able to recognize and I don't think I'm special in this. I'm just a person, you know, reading what they're putting down. I realized that what they were trying to say would get across. If someone looked at their work, if somebody looked at their work and took it as like, this is an important piece of artwork to ponder and understand, that someone was going to get it or get close to it. The last thing I'll say about context is I say all this as a 30 whatever year old person who has been tinkering with these ideas and thinking through this and reading books for more than a decade. But I remember this idea was initially posed to me in college. And it was one of those, like, I still remember where I was standing when this idea was floated to me. And I think about it now. My painting professor said to us, imagine there's a hollowed out gourd and someone has painted wings on it and stripes on it and put little antenna on it. And... They hung it up and they put a hole in it for a bird to come in and it's a bird feeder. In one scenario, it's hanging with 20 other almost identical gourds that are painted the same way. And it's at a booth and a craft fair in the Ozarks. And, you know, what would you pay for it? How would you interact with it? What would you think about it? And there's another scenario where that exact same gourd is put on a white pedestal in a gallery in Chelsea. (laughs) And it has a label and it, you know, it's, it, it has some crazy title that activates it, you know, bird song number five, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> how would you interact with those differently? And how is the context important? I think my last thing that I want to impart on you guys is be willing to the best of your ability to give yourself the white pedestal and the label if that's the interaction you crave with people. And no one is going to give that feeling of you deserved it to you no one's going to give you that title no one's going to ordain you as like a formal artist or a conceptual artist or a real artist or however you sort of mentally picture that it's a title that you go and you get and if you feel like you embody that then you make the art that speaks to those conversations and don't look back don't question yourself I'm proud of you I'm cheering for you and I hope that made any sense (laughs) at all thank you so much for listening let me know if you guys want me to talk about Pierre Bourdieu more because I could talk about it forever (laughs) have a great rest of your day I'll talk to you guys next week I have an interview with an artist I know you guys are going to love and um, yeah happy painting (laughs) 
Thank you so much for listening and thank you for being here. I wanted to also encourage you guys to leave a review. The feedback is incredibly helpful. And if you leave a review, I will read your handle or your name on the following week's episode. Take care, y'all, and happy creating.